Hey, hello guys. So it's a great pleasure to have Dr. Azade Malik Nejad from CERN uh, Theoretical Physics Department. She's going to speak about spinning fins in inflation and their remnants in the sky. I think she's the first uh, lady guest in the speaker list, I think. And uh, hopefully more and more lady participants can join, I think, and uh, maybe other Azade can convince few people so that they can give some lectures. Anyways, I'm very thankful to Azade for uh, saying yes to give a, a broad overview on this subject. And this is the 68th Zuminar in the series. And we are all welcoming you from uh, India. Right now I'm in India, so uh, from India. So you can start as a day from your end. Uh, thanks, Ayantan, for the nice um, uh, kind uh, invitation and a nice uh, introduction. I think Eva Silverstein also gave a lecture. So probably I'm not the first one. Mm. Sorry, but, this is the second one. I'm sorry, Teresa. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> but in any case, it's a real honor. Thanks, thanks a lot for having me. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm very excited today. Uh, thanks all, I mean, good day. Thanks all for joining. And I'm very excited today to tell you about spinning fields in inflation and the remnants in the sky. So, um, and by the way, feel free to interrupt me at any time with your questions. Um, uh, and Azad, yeah, just- Can you go to the first slide, please, for a bit? Just, uh, just move, yes. Now you can move. Okay. Next <laughs> uh, one. Yeah, so feel free to interrupt me at any time with your questions, because I would love to make it as interactive as possible. So let us start with a brief recap of cosmic history. So as you know, our universe is expanding and for many, I mean, uh, it started too tiny, too hot and probably from a big bang singularity. And for many years, it was filled with a hot plasma. And as it expands, it becomes colder and colder. So in a normal, uh, room, um, when uh, the temperature is colder, uh, the molecules have a small kinetic term and they hardly uh, uh, bump into each other. But as the temperature increases, their kinetic term, uh, their, their kinetic energy increases and they keep pumping to each other. And uh, in fact, the same thing is happening in, in the universe. Uh, so let's see what will happen if we heat things up. Uh, imagine that we start with a system of neutral atoms and then we keep uh, heating them up. At some point, the temperature will get as high uh, that can actually free each of the uh, electrons in the neutral atom. And at that point, uh, the electrons will get unbound from uh, the nuclear. Uh, and then we will have a hot plasma. The same thing is actually happening in the universe. So at some point uh, after the Big Bang, it, the temperature was that high that we had basically a hot plasma and particles were, there were lots of charged particles that keep bumping into each other. And in fact, it was totally opaque because photons had to interact with lots of charged particles. But as universe expands, it becomes, at some point, it becomes cold, becomes cold enough so that the neutral atoms form. And at that time, photons got free to scatter uh, through this, um, the universe. And that's the point that CMB, cosmic microwave background, is formed. Uh, CMB is the first uh, snapshot of the universe and since it's a selfie, that's technically the first selfie of history as well. And then as, uh, as the time uh, goes, at some point the universe becomes uh, cold enough that these neutral atoms assembled uh, gravitationally and formed the larger scale structures that we see today. Uh, 
In fact, our universe turns out to be too simple, too symmetric at very large scales. And uh, so if we take CMB, for example, it is nearly homogeneous and isotropic all over the sky with teeny tiny fluctuations on its surface, uh, the order of 10 to minus five. So it's really a surprise unless we have an explanation. Yes. So we know that if you look into the CMB sky, it almost look uh, homogeneous and isotropic, almost. But like, if I ask you exactly, means like not maybe, uh, so you can better to tell me that from what exact point the inhomogeneity grows in the time scale? What exact point? So I just want to understand. I know, uh, very yeah, I know the source of everything comes from the quantum fluctuations that happen in the early universe. But I'm saying that the like, those quantum fluctuations, which are very tiny in the early universe, that is basically a very huge thing in the large scale structure. So <clears throat> like when uh, this kind of inhomogeneities people should really take care of in the time scale, when it is very dominant? Uh, very good question. Actually, it, uh, it requires like uh, more details, but let me just give you a brief answer. Uh, some of these fluctuations uh, are, so these fluctuations are basically, um, maybe it's better if I answer your question in a, in an, uh, a couple of uh, slides later, because I have a slide for that. It's okay, completely, I just ask you. Yeah, 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 that's a very good uh, question. I will get back to your question in a few minutes. Because uh, why, why I have asked you particularly, I can tell, because we used to do the perturbation theory always. Okay, by assuming that something is small and we use the order by order perturbation theory. Now, if him inhomogeneities are very large, at some point this perturbation will not work. So exactly. that is very basically my question, it, exactly which point. So yeah, maybe you can give the answer later. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, so up to, so in this uh, talk, I mainly talk about the regime in which we can work uh, perturbations. But as you said, as we get to lower redshifts, like very uh, close to the uh, scale of, uh, uh, to our modern universe, then at some point this cosmic perturbation wouldn't work because uh, actually th these are these, these non-linearities which form the galaxies in larger scale structures, mm -hmm. uh, right? Yes. Yeah, but, but in this talk, my main, uh, like everything that I'm going to tell you is supposed to, uh, to be doable by using cosmic perturbations. Sure. But I will get back to your question in a few uh, minutes. It's okay, no problem. Thanks. Okay, so this uh, large scale structure symmetry is kind of a surprise. So we really need to explain it, why it's, uh, it's the case. And the leading paradigm to explain that unexpected uh, symmetry uh, is the cosmic inflation, which is a period uh, shortly after the Big Bang singularity, during which uh, the size of the universe uh, increases by a factor of e to 16. And just to have a feeling about the, the, the size of this number, that's technically the same as if a bacterium suddenly it starts exponentially expanding and in a fraction of a second later, it becomes as big as the whole Milky Way. So totally insane. Uh, but what caused inflation? A scalar field uh, slow rolling toward its true vacuum uh, actually provides the simplest model for inflation, although the exact physics of inflation, particle physics of inflation is still unknown. So the setup that I'm talking about is the minimal uh, scenario. Uh, so uh, we basically assume that uh, in inflation, uh, the whole universe is filled with a scalar field, which is homogeneous. So it's only, so at any uh, time, it's uh, the same all over the sky and only varies with time. Uh, and then uh, 
this is basically the, the energy density and the pressure of such scalar field. And in the limit that uh, its potential dominates over its kinetic term, uh, meaning the, the potential is very flat, uh, such a system will um, provide a universe which has a, a exponential expansion. So in a more formal way, it's a quasi density expansion. And um, so at some point that the uh, inflation um, is not flat oh. anymore. That, yes. Uh, yes. It's quasi decision. You want to mean that uh, otherwise the, uh, you can't stop the inflation. So you need something quasi decision. Yeah, but what is just, I'm again asking, maybe you can give, give the answer or not. There is something called eternal inflation. What is that? Right. Is that stoppable or not stoppable? Uh, that's, uh, I think there are, uh, so the thing is that imagine that I, uh, that I didn't have this kind of feature in the potential. Mm -hmm. So it was flat forever then that would be basically something like a cosmological term. Yeah. Uh, so eternal inflation scenarios are those that inflation would never end. Oh. Uh, we have a parameter epsilon, which is the time variation of the Hubble. Mm -hmm. um, in those scenarios, and epsilon basically will tell us when inflation, when we have slow rate inflation, meaning that epsilon, which is minus h dot over h squared, mm -hmm. is very small. And when inflation ends, this parameter epsilon should get close to one. Yeah. In eternal inflation scenarios, you, you may start from a small epsilon, but the epsilon only decreases with time. So from a quasi decita expansion, you only get closer to exact decita, oh. and inflation would never end. But, in, uh, but since we know that inflation ends at some point, so this parameter epsilon, which should start from a small value during slow rate inflation, so that some point uh, gets one and inflation ends. Yeah. Um, so that's that's the uh, the basically uh, uh, the idea. But in order to cook such a scenario that inflation ends, then it means that uh, you need to 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 think about the right form of potential. In this uh, cartoon, I, I showed a scenario in which we have a slow inflation, and at some point, inflation would end. So, yeah. yeah. So, can you please? Uh, I know that uh, which condition gives you when inflation ends, but uh, like from where it, this criteria is exactly coming? Who knows that at that point, that condition is giving like which theory or which background is giving that epsilon tending to be one when inflation ends? Um, so as I said, if you have something like this one, that inflation actually, so you have a scalar field that moves towards its true vacuum, mm -hmm. uh, then, uh, and at some point it's, uh, it's a, almost a flat potential, it can give you such thing. Uh, another idea is that I'm going to tell you about uh, more is that so recently people are taking gauge fields in inflation more seriously. Um, and if, if you think about it, then then basically at some point, and so in these scenarios, inflation is not cold anymore, but mm -hmm. uh, you're generating gauge fields in inflation. Mm -hmm. And the, the more you get close to end of inflation, uh, uh, the, the inflaton will give more energy, injects more energy to the gauge field, but at some point it becomes the, the dominant uh, component and inflation ends in radiation era. Okay. So that's another possibility. But if, if I, I the, the really honest answer is that there are zillion uh, scenarios. Yes. And since um, honestly, uh, the particle physics of inflation is still not that, um, uh, well understood, uh, and also the the, the preheating. Uh, there are several different uh, possibilities for that. I just gave you some uh, very like uh, uh, famous examples. Yeah, it's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, then.
Um, so, so far, so good. We realized that we had this unexpected uh, larger scale symmetry in the universe, and we have some ideas how to explain it. Uh, but up to this point, uh, we turned off quantum fluctuations. In fact, the real fine stars, once we turn on quantum fluctuations on the top of that, uh, as you know, due to uncertainty principle, quantum vacuum is not nothing nor empty. And it's this vast ocean neutral particles, which are getting generated and annihilated in a fraction of a second. So yes, we start from vacuum and then we end in vacuum. Uh, but in the, on, on average, still we have nothing. Uh, however, in the presence of a background field, if the background field is strong enough, it can upgrade this virtual particles into actual particles. Uh, such a, some examples of such background fields are uh, an electric field that can generate particles uh, by Schrodinger effect or a gravitational field which can produce them gravitationally. Uh, in fact, inflation itself can produce particles. Uh, so in flat space, we have, uh, at some point, we have a virtual pair of particles, but they end up uh, annihilating each other and we end up with vacuum. In an expanding universe, if, if the expansion rate is very large, at some point, uh, imagine this, this virtual pair of particles which got generated at some point uh, during the equation. Then by the time they want to find each other to get annihilated, the space underlying them expands so vastly they cannot find each other. And as a result, it leads to particle production. Uh, this effect first has been uh, discovered by, uh, by uh, Schrodinger and notice the date. It's right at the beginning of World War II. Uh, <laughs> Schrodinger, uh, Schrodinger was so shocked by his own discovery that just by expanding universe, he can create particles that he called it an alarming phenomenon. Interestingly, 80 years later, it's not the way that we think about it today. In fact, we think that we are the product of those quantum fluctuations in the very early universe. Uh, so let me tell you how. <laughs> so the exponential expansion of the universe turns initial quantum vac vacuum fluctuations into actual cosmic perturbations by this particle production uh, mechanism. So we start from some primordial uh, fluctuations. By cosmic evolution, they tend to CMB fluctuations. And ultimately, then following the cosmic evolution, at some point, they will produce the larger scale structures that we see today. So that's the, the point that uh, up to this point, we can use uh, perturbation theory to explain uh, uh, the, the large scale structure. Uh, Sayantan asked me for up to what point we can use this the scenario. The thing is that at some point, uh, so you see the, the, light, uh, the light areas in, in this matter um, distribution slide, uh, the, the, the density of matter in those areas are so large that they, uh, the, the pressure is not enough to, to just take them like that. And, gravity can collapse them. And they will, at some point, the, the density of those areas would be so large that, that cosmic perturbation wouldn't work anymore. And at some point, we need to, uh, to use simulations. Um, I think we can do that up to a scale, which is around uh, um, the BAO scale, which is 100 uh, megaparsec. Uh, honestly, I I need to <laughs> I need to to take a look at this, uh, Sayantan. I uh, okay. I have two numbers in my mind, and I I'm Don't not sure which one is which. Numbers, because I'm very bad on numbers. 
<laughs> I just asked. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> no I, I, that's a very, very good question. The thing is that because my, in my mind, I was just thinking about perturbations. Mm -hmm. I, Perfect. I didn't have the number, but I will give it to you uh, later. Thanks a lot. Are there any more questions? Okay. So, but that's not just that. Uh, the, the, the previous slide was about energy density, which is a scalar, but that's not all because this initial quantum fluctuations has another part, which has a spin two nature, and those are primordial gravitational waves. Uh, so these primordial gravitational waves are tiny waves in the fabrics of space time that squeeze and stretch anything in their past uh, when they pass by. So here, for example, you see uh, that when uh, they path through this direction, at some, at some direction they, uh, they squeeze, the other uh, direction stretch, and then uh, it happens in the um, other direction. Uh, and these are actually given by a very simple field equation that's simply box Hij equals zero. And this Hij is that gravitational wave that I told you, this HIJ is a, uh, is a three by three matrix with two uh, dynamical degree of freedom. Uh, in fact, you can decompose it in terms of H plus and H minus, which are its two different uh, helicity states or polarization states. And this is basically uh, the left-handed polarization gravitational waves. And since they are basically, uh, they, they don't have any source and they are just generated by, uh, by vacuum, they are unpolarized. So they're basically uh, the left and right handed or plus or minus uh, helicity states uh, have the same size. And there is, uh, it's only uh, really uh, nearly Gaussian because they're just uh, vacuum gravitational waves. Uh, and so here, for example, we have this H plus minus in terms of their momentum. If you plot them, you will see that they have this structure. This, this orange line is uh, the point of horizon crossing. So that's when, so imagine that you have a gravitational wave mode with momentum K. At some point that it will get, uh, because by, uh, by the exponential expansion of the universe, that's like, you're, the, you're uh, stretching the, the wave number of your mode. And at some point it will get out of the horizon. And this, this orange line is basically the point of uh, getting uh, crossing the, the horizon. At very uh, deep inside the horizon. So here uh, you see that we're basically having something like a, like a uh, wave. And, uh, and this, this limit, uh, basically, so this is basically about this gravitational waves where we, they are deep inside uh, the cosmic horizon, and, and these are basically just quantum fluctuations. So uh, they, they they have a form of a, a vacuum, and this is the so-called Bunch-Davis uh, vacuum. On the other hand, when we get out. Uh, at the super horizon scale, when this, this modes gets out of the horizon, uh, they will get to an almost, they, they asymptotically approach a constant uh, value. Uh, oops. <laughs> and uh, their power spectrum outside of the horizon were basically uh, given by a, a simple uh, form. And that's given by the scale of uh, inflation. H is the Hubble constant during inflation and M uh, Planck is bas uh, basically the, uh, the Planckness. Uh, so yeah, they are very simple outside of a horizon. They're almost constant. Uh, and these primordial gravitational waves are actually extremely powerful uh, because let's, compare them with CMB photons. As we discussed earlier, uh, only just after CMB is formed, the uh, photons were free to scatter through the, the, um, uh, the cosmos. 
uh, but before that, uh, it was opaque for uh, photons. Gravitational waves, however, are much more uh, interesting. In fact, they are very powerful and their power is in their weakness because, um, so it's easy to, to detect photons, but it's easier to block them. For gravitational waves, are, it's hard to detect them, but it's really hard to block them as well. So once they get detected, they can tell us about all the way back to the very early universe. So once they get observed, they, they can tell us a lot about the physics of the very early universe that, that's not possible by the other uh, uh, props. And uh, they, they got imprinted on CMB uh, polarization because of their importance. There are several uh, uh, missions to, to look for them. And the, the most famous one are the light bed satellite and CMBS4 fingers crossed uh, to both of them. Okay, so up to here, we realize that uh, observations are in perfect agreement with the concept of inflation. Uh, the particle physics of inflation is still unknown, uh, but the standard models of inflation are based on um, scalar fields. Um, something that I should mention here is that we know that in order to explain the matter asymmetry in the universe, uh, we need some sources of CP violation. Uh, but since the, it is assumed that uh, parity and CP are the symmetry of inflation, it must happen after uh, inflation and pro most probably uh, from the neutrino sector. Uh, also, we realize that uh, inflation predicts primordial gravitational waves, which are unpolarized and Gaussian. Uh, and uh, as I told you, uh, that CP phase, uh, uh, the, the baryon asymmetry requires some CP violating phases that should happen after inflation. Okay, so far so good, but what about gauge fields uh, in inflation? Uh, are, are there any questions up to this point? Uh, I have a I have a very silly question, I guess. Yeah, but it, it's uh, like so you use a scalar field uh, to uh, model inflation. Uh, how does it uh, give rise to uh, gravitational waves, which are tensorial? Very good question. <laughs> Yes, uh, that's a very good question. The thing is that I, um, so here we only talked about some matter field. So when you perturb this, this matter field, you will have some extra uh, matter fields with the same nature. Uh, in this case, it would be a scalar. But the thing is that when we want to, uh, to study cosmic perturbations, it's not only the matter field that we quantize, but also the space-time itself or metric itself. Uh, it's not quantum gravity. It's sort of a semi-classical treatment. And the thing is that, um, so the, the background geometry is FRW, uh, but then on the top of that, we, uh, we add some perturbations for the metric. And when you perturb the, your metric, you will have extra degrees of freedom so Some of them are. Azade, it's basically yeah. can be tell from the Einstein equation. So one side of the Einstein oh. equation you know, are so other side has to. Yeah. Be. I understand. Uh, so uh, I just had one follow up to that, uh, which is how do you quantize the metric tensor? Because I haven't uh, come across uh, actual methods. So if you could shed some light on that briefly. Yeah, sure. I, I wish I had some slides, but uh, I can just briefly uh, tell you this, and then I would be happy to discuss more later. Uh, the thing is yeah, that sure. you decompose the, uh, when you're dealing with the metric, it's not all physical degrees of freedom because you also have a, a, a coordinate, a, a coordinate a system that you choose, and these are basically gauge degrees of freedom. Uh, you need somehow to, uh, to get rid of those unphysical gauge degrees of freedom 
and then the rest would be dynamical degrees of freedom. For any dynamical degree of freedom, you associate some, uh, some initial quantum fluctuations to that. Part of this, this dynamical degrees of freedom is a scheme two, which is gravitational waves. Uh, so basically, uh, that's uh, if, if I decomp, uh, so imagine GIJ, I and uh, GIJ is the uh, totally spatial part of the metric. Yeah. Uh, uh, part of this GIJ has a, a, this, this HIJ in it. Yeah. And that's, um, uh, that's the, the, the spin two part. As for the initial condition, we, we put this. I see. Uh, so it's, it's like a similar to Einstein's uh, derivation of the gravitational waves, where he, instead of uh, the perturbations which he introduced, you're introducing space dependent perturbations. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. And um, so comparing to, to classical gravitational waves, uh, these are quantum and uh, and the way that you can tell it is because of this, this initial condition. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Thank okay. you. <laughs> are there any other questions? Okay. If no, then let's see why, why gauge fields in inflation. Uh, well, why not? <laughs> inflation happens at the highest energy scales observable to us. Gauge fields are all over the place in building blocks of uh, standard model and particle physics and beyond. Uh, so what do they do in inflation? Can gauge fields contribute to physics of inflation? And if they do, do they leave an observable signature so we can test them? and how much they can change the course of cosmic history. Well, it turns out that gauge field can actually contribute to physics of inflation. And if they were around, they uh, leave robust prediction for gravitational wave background. So we can tell, uh, we can test it. And they can change the course of cosmic history and uh, they lead to uh, novel mechanisms for uh, barrier and dark genesis. So let's first start with how to have gauge fields in inflation. Uh, normal gauge fields, when they only are given by the Yang theory, they act like radiation. So with the scale factor, uh, they, they will decay like any radiation. And that's basically, uh, the energy density will decay like one over A to four. And remember that the scale factor is increasing exponentially during the inflation. So it means that our gauge field uh, will decay like one over A, exponential decay. So in order for the gauge field to contribute to physics of inflation, first off, conformal symmetry should be gone. Uh, how we're dealing with gauge fields, we are not free to break it however we want. Uh, so we need to respect the gauge symmetry. Uh, it turns out that the, the common solution to both of these issues is to add new terms to the gauge theory, uh, which are gauge invariant and also break the conformal symmetry. Uh, so the simplest thing that you can come up with is basically F of tilde squared. Uh, what is that? It's basically, it has the, uh, the equation of state of a cosmological term. So if you compute the, the energy density and pressure at this term, you will realize that the rho is equal to minus P. So in fact, if during inflation, we have this term plus Yang mills, it means that we start with, a, uh, with the quasi docita expansion but then eventually, because the Yang mills is now the kinetic term, uh, it will uh, receive energy from this term and eventually inflation will end in radiation era. Um, so this term is nothing but an effective field theory coming out of a, a more familiar thing, which is basically the chern simon interaction with an axion. So, uh, imagine we have an axion in photon, so that scalar field that I told you about in a, uh, earlier, uh, imagine that is the axion. 
And the, the in photon is now coupled to a gauge field with this interaction. Uh, these are basically the same thing. I only, uh, uh, if you integrate out the, the axion, you will get uh, this step. Okay, so far so good. But then it <laughs> leads to the third challenge, which is this about the spatial isotropy and homogeneity. That we know that our uh, very large scale universe uh, um, has. Uh, and the point is that imagine that you have a, a normal uh, gauge field like a U1 a vector, and it, it has a homogeneous uh, solution all over the sky. So it means that all over the sky you have a vector in some given uh, direction. It immediately breaks the specialized hypertrophy. So that's, that's, a, that's a, an issue, how to explain the, the, uh, the spatial isotropy and homogeneity while we have a gauge field. It turns out that if instead of a U1 gauge field, we have a SU2 gauge field, it can do uh, the job. Now, instead of one gauge field, we have three, uh, because it's a, uh, so A mu is not A, uh, uh, this, this has some uh, uh, internal uh, symmetry for itself. Uh, this is A, A, mu, uh, which is uh, the component, times T, A, which is an SU2 uh, uh, generator. We have three of them, and they are not commuting with each other, but they have this, this, uh, 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 this relation with, uh, uh, with, it, with each other. Uh, uh, now, it is possible to have a solution which is spatially uh, isotropic and uh, homogeneous. So let's see how. Uh, okay, we know that, uh, let's go to the temporal case. So we set A0 to zero. Uh, for a U1 uh, gauge field, which has a homogeneous solution, let's say it's in the direction uh, Z. Once we rotate uh, the space, <laughs> uh, it will rotate like a vector and it will break the spatial isotropy. With the SU2 gauge field, of course it's a vector, so under a rotation it will also rotate like a vector. So now we have three uh, different colors of the gauge field and by rotation they will rotate, each of them will rotate like a vector. But there is something interesting about SU2. Uh, once we set the temporal gauge, so still A0 is zero, zero, you can check that it's, it, it won't uh, remove all gauge degrees of freedom. But you can also cook up some more uh, gauge transformation which preserve the temporal gauge. And, uh, and they have the same structure as uh, the rotation because uh, the SU2 and SO3 algebras are basically uh, the same. Uh, and remember that as a gauge, uh, as a gauge field, they are only specified up to gauge transformations, and that's uh, the, the gauge transformation part is not the physical uh, uh, thing. So now, thanks to this residual SU2 gauge transformations for any rotation that we choose, we can find the proper gauge transformation that cancel that, and we end up with the same solution, uh, which is this one. So in fact, you can write uh, this simple solution in a, uh, in, uh, so in this solution that you, you see here, uh, it's basically coming from identifying the index of algebra and uh, the space. Uh, but you can write it in a funny way that like you can rotate it or using this, this gauge transformation and make it look uh, scary and funny. Uh, but because of this, this two uh, uh, transformations, you can always have the solution. And if you write uh, the energy momentum tensor of that, you will see that it's perfectly isotropic and homogeneous. So thanks to this uh, isomorphy between SO3 and SU2 algebras, uh, SU2 gauge field can restore the isotropy. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, no. Uh, okay, 
Then uh, you may say, I assume that uh, I, I show you that there exists this perfectly isotropic and homogeneous field configuration if the algebra is SU2. Uh, oh, uh, wait a minute. Uh, it's not just SU2, you can assume any SUN. And once the solution is in an SU2 subsector of that SUN, still have anything that I told you is valid. But SU2 is the simplest one. I just, that's why I keep using that. Uh, okay, so I, I, I showed you that there is this solution for uh, the SU2 uh, gauge field that's perfectly isotropic, but uh, in the universe, initial conditions are not our choice. And there might be that it's the system uh, doesn't exactly start from this a perfectly isotropic solution, then what would happen? Also for the geometry of the space time, FRW is this perfectly isotropic geometry in which the expansion rate uh, uh, the space in uh, all of the direction is the same. Imagine that instead of a, for W, we, we, we started a little bit away from that, like we start from a Bianchi uh, geometry, which is basically a space time in which the expansion rate, in, let's say in this direction, is different than the expansion rate in the other direction. Then if this isotropic uh, uh, field configuration is not stable, uh, uh, even if we start from perfectly isotropic solution, uh, shortly after that we get away from that, we end up in an isotropic uh, geometry which is definitely not the space time uh, that, that we observe today around us. So uh, this is a very important question to see if this initial isotropic solution is the attractor or not. Uh, interestingly, although we have this gauge field and it, has the, it, it can, can in principle have an isotropic uh, uh, field configuration apart from this perfectly isotropic one, uh, but the isotropic solution is the attractor. So even if you start away from a perfectly isotropic solution, the anisotropy will uh, exponentially decay. And shortly after um, a few, uh, let's say, uh, shortly after that, we will end up with a perfectly isotropic uh, um, space time. And the reason for that is basically remember that that was the FF tilde interaction between the axion, which was the infoton field, and the gauge field uh, that, that makes the gauge field to survive the exponential expansion. And that term, this FF tilde, only sourced the isotropic part of the gauge field. So the anisotropic part, uh, anything on the top of this, if it's a, so imagine that you add extra term, a homogeneous solution to this, uh, this gauge field, then that one wouldn't receive a contribution from its interaction with the axion. So that part is only given, uh, acts like a radiation and would decay uh, in inflation. Okay, uh, enough, uh, are, are there any questions? Okay. Uh, am I going too fast or too slow? No, 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 no. You are explaining things perfectly. It's okay. okay. Yeah, but, but it's not a good sign when people stop asking questions. And no. that's. <laughs> I don't know why, but yeah, like people will ask, I hopefully. Even I will ask. Okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I think there, when you have uh, mentioned about this action, this uh, parameter f, which is the sometimes we know as the axion decay constant. So is it a time dependent parameter or just a constant thing? A very good question. So I'm exactly at the right time because I'm right at the slide. Uh, so uh, let me first start with gauge function and then I will go to your questions, Ayantan. Okay. Thanks for asking that. So uh, at first, when um, uh, 
this, this, this non-ability and gauge fields in inflation first has been introduced in, in the scenario gauge inflation. And that's basically a normal general relativity uh, time plus a, a normal uh, yang means theory, which is a theory of uh, all gauge fields. Uh, uh, plus this extra pink term, which is f of tilde squared. And I told you that acts like a cosmological term. So uh, during inflation, if it's a dominant term, it will be uh -huh. like... When you yes. have added this AF, AF dual, so this is no longer be a kinetic term. This is kind of an interaction. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Uh, yes, and also this F uh, this uh, this non-abelian gauge fields are self-interacting uh, uh, by uh, definition because if you write uh, uh, the F nu nu of this this gauge field, you will have this extra term. So because they are non-abelian, they have their own self-interactions even without the pink term. Yeah, but thank you for for uh, for the question. Yes. Uh, uh, so, so this term is basically uh, acting uh, like a uh, uh, like a cosmological term, and while uh, during inflation is the dominant term, uh, we will have a slow roll uh, inflation at some point. Uh, the uh, and and it keep injecting energy to the Yang means, which is the kinetic term for the gauge field. At some point, uh, the Yang means will get dominated, and uh, inflation ends in radiation error. And gauge inflation is basically an effective field theory coming out of a larger uh, uh, theory, which is introduced uh, exactly one year after. Like, uh, uh, so we introduced uh, gauge inflation in February, and chromonetra is introduced one year later in February. <laughs> um, and that's basically um, a normal natural inflation, which is an inflationary model based on having uh, an axion with the cosine potential. Uh, but, in, uh, but now uh, they, uh, it's, uh, the axion is coupled uh, with this non-abelian gauge field in this uh, pink term. Uh, and of course, it also has the Yang mm -hmm. uh, term. Can I say Next slide. that if you have the chromo natural model and if you, are, if you just integrate the scalar field, part integrate the scalar field and write down an effective theory, it will boils down to your model? Exactly, yes, yes. Uh, so as, as, as you said, uh, the thing is that uh, if, if I'm in the limit that the axion is very massive, that mm -hmm. I, I can integrate that out, exactly as you said, then, uh, then after integrating out the, the axion, I will have twice of this term, which is here. Okay. Yeah. And another and, question I have, which is, uh, we all talk about something called effective theory of inflation, okay? So, like uh, Jared Kaplan and then Paolo Cremelini and more people have pointed that if you break the time diffeomorphism in the space-time, you can generate the fluctuations, but you don't need to put the uh, scalar field or any particular field. You can actually generate all the possible fluctuations from the mid from the, uh, like Einstein action along with the boundary terms. Okay, now the similar kind of gauge inflation or the whatever chromo natural inflation, the similar kind of setup can be able to obtain from the those kind of setups as well? Like- uh, That's a you, very good question. Very uh, don't uh, care about any interaction term because like it is very complicated sometimes to understand because it also involves the background physics because people will ask you immediately from which kind of physics it comes, what is the dif difficulties, this, that. But once you talk about effective theory, uh, mostly people just don't care about any background physics. They just say that the, whether the symmetry can generate the all possible fluctuations or not. So I'm just asking that like here you have SU N or SU2 type of symmetry. Okay. so like those kind of things can able to generate the perturbations automatically from the metric or maybe the like Einstein term along with the boundary terms, something like that. Uh, that's a very good question. And as you said, there is this, this bulk of 
uh, work, uh, several uh, interesting works on effective field theory of inflation, and they're mainly uh, based on scalar fields. There, I think there are some, but very limited attempt to generalize well, this idea I, I to vector field, but paper. not gauge field. I have seen only one paper, and then people haven't done anything. So I was just doubting that whether there is something wrong or not. A very good uh, question. The thing is that that paper is based on having vector fields and not gauge fields. When you uh, assume that you have a gauge field, ha the, 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 the idea of adding a gauge field, which is also non-abelian, it, it extremely limited the number of interactions that you can add to your uh, scenario. So it's not like a scalar field that you have plenty of um, possibilities to add. With gauge fields, it's just uh, the, at the dominant term, you, ha you have the Yang Mills and FF tilde, right? So but, imagine that. Uh, but in that case, you are in the safe side, but because there you can immediately connect the theory with the effective field theory, because there are very less num least number of possibilities. Exactly, yes, yeah. uh, exactly. So uh, the thing is that uh, you can, of course, add higher order terms, but, uh, so I will tell you later why uh, both of the scenarios are, are, are not working. So uh, in a few slides, and then I will tell you the, the model that will work. <laughs> um, the thing is that, yeah, the, uh, this, this higher order terms are, um, uh, are, are subleading and the dominant terms are this ones. Of course, if at some point we can, uh, our, our, our understanding of the scenarios is precise enough, uh, then we can add extra terms to, uh, to get uh, extra information. But at the moment, I think, uh, yeah, uh, I think we're, we're fine with just uh, the Yang Mills and the Chen Simon. Oh. Um, and, and about your question about F, uh, the decay constant of the axion, uh, in the scenarios, we assume that the F is a constant. Oh. Uh, it, uh, if you, if you, uh, uh, if, uh, so about the the natural inflation, which oh, why I'm actually worried about, particularly reason I want to mention, because choosing f to be constant sometimes related to the supersymmetry breaking, or something like that. Uh, so, like some cases you can choose, but there are scenarios where you have to take f to be dynamical. So that's why I'm asking that. Is there any restriction where you can work on this, like the restriction of the parameter f? Uh, yeah. So uh, the thing is that. So let me just just tell you something about natural inflation. Let's forget about the gauge field. Uh, if only we have the axion as the inflaton, we know that the cosine potential uh, is not flat enough to support slower inflation. So we need a super Planckian. F and F is the decay constant is sort of the cutoff of the theory, and it's not very natural for the cutoff of, of, of our theory to be a super Planckian, at least uh, uh, as far as I understand. Because, like, um, if you choose super Planckian, then claiming that to be the effective field theory is also very problematic, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But then adding this term, this interaction with the gauge field, uh, will provide a source of friction. So now, uh, uh, if, if the, the, the action potential is not uh, flat enough and there is no interaction, all this, this, uh, this kinetic energy will go uh, uh, to, to the axion and will uh, stop the slow roll inflation. When you have this interaction with the, uh, with the axion, um, so the, now uh, part of, the, uh, part of this, this energy uh, will go uh, to the uh, gauge field because of this friction term. And the effective uh, potential that you will have for the axion will be flat enough uh, to, uh, to explain, uh, uh, to provide slow roll. Um, and in that case, then you can have uh, 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 small F values like sub and F values. Uh, um, however, uh, the thing is that inspired by this, uh, the scenarios, uh, several different uh, realizations of SU2 uh, gauge fields and non-abelian gauge fields have been introduced and studied in the literature. 
Uh, this is just uh, uh, an, an incomplete list of uh, scenarios, just, just different realizations, but um, I'm not talking about it. different studies of uh, phenomenology and different observable uh, signatures, just, uh, just diff very different realizations. Uh, uh, Gish version and Coroma natural are ruled out by the data. Uh, and the reason is that um, uh, this, this parameter kappa in gauge function, which is related to lambda in Coroma natural, uh, both of the scenarios required a large value for lambda or kappa. So lambda should be around 100 and more. Um, and that will provide lots of gravitational waves, which is now ruled out by the uh, uh, by the cosmological uh, data uh, by Planck. And also from the theoretical point of view, it's, uh, I think as uh, Sayantan uh, was trying to, uh, to warn me, uh, this, this large value of lambda and kappa are extremely hard to justify by uh, string theory. And of course, if, if you think about just particle physics uh, interactions, it would be even much harder, uh, but I, I I kind of have this this uh, this idea that at that energy scales we need to take care of uh, uh, stringy effective terms, um, and uh, so on. On that, uh, uh, these these large values of lambda are, are not uh, theoretically uh, uh, justified. So then, uh, among different other scenarios that you can fix this, uh, this issues, like observational issue and theoretical issue. Uh, this is my favorite one, which is the minimal uh, SU2 action inflation scenario. And that's basically if you replace the cosine potential for the axion with a potential which is flat enough, let's say coming from axion monogeny, uh, uh, then, uh, you can have sub and uh, decay constant values. So F can be anything less than 0.1 M Planck. And lambda is also, uh, it can be as small as you want. Uh, but still, the, the, it would have its own uh, interesting uh, physics. Uh, did I answer your question, Sayantan? Yes, yes. Uh, coming to this new proposal, this V phi can be anything or a particular structure of V phi is allowed? Uh, so uh, the thing is that uh, uh, there is this uh, this interesting like a uh, bulk of work on um, uh, string motivated uh, potential for the axion inflation, mm -hmm. uh, and and I think uh, Eva Silverstein has a lot of seminal works on that. Uh, so my idea was uh, was basically to to use that kind of uh, potential. I'm not familiar with the string theory. I just uh, no, that's okay. I'm, that's okay. I'm just asking you because, like, I want to just uh, know about this thing because, like, um, here uh, the coupling between the field uh, means the scalar field and the gauge field is important because why I, I just want to point. I don't know. Like, this is related to that. But there is something called magnetogenesis, inflationary magnetogenesis. There, people used to say that your uh, coupling uh, of uh, scalar field with the gauge field is important, which will break the U1 symmetry. And that uh, they want, and that they choose the coupling according to that, some power law or something like that, some A to the power alpha or something like that. So I'm just asking, is this somehow related to the uh, magnetic field generation in the um, uh, primordial universe or something like that? Uh, interesting question. So I know uh, two different, so first of all, uh, in, in magnetogenesis scenarios is based on a U1. Uh, so in case that, um, and I know two different realizations of that. Uh -huh. uh, some is like, uh, so they need to break the conformal symmetry of Yang mills. And some do that by adding an F phi uh, mm -hmm. to the uh, to the Yang mist theory, mm -hmm. and the other were just uh, uh, adding this this F of tilde term. Yeah, uh, as far as I can remember, they told uh, in the literature if it is FF dual, then it will generate the helical magnetic field. 
Right, right. Uh, yeah. uh, but uh, the thing is that you have, uh, you, they, they can uh, actually, uh, so the gauge field, if it's a U1 and you turn on a web for it, it will break the, uh, the special isotropy. So you will have an isotropy power spectrum. Uh, but you can still turn it on as a quantum fluctuation, and I believe that's uh, the thing they do. Uh, but there are differences uh, here. So, the kind, of course, in inflation, we have both uh, electric and magnetic component of the gauge field, but it's not the, the standard model uh, mm. photon. It's just an extra SU2. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the physics is, uh, it's, it's, uh, it is similar and different. Uh, the similarity is that, yes, we are producing uh, the electric and magnetic components of an SU2 gauge field. Mm -hmm. And they have uh, the same for a U1 gauge field, but there are uh, differences and they, they are very di important differences that I will tell you later on. Okay, sure. Uh, are there any more questions? Is there is any question? Please ask, guys. I think you guys are like freezed. Nobody's asking any question. Okay, no, uh, <laughs> maybe they will ask. I don't want to force anybody to ask anything, but yeah. Okay. Like. So, up to now, we realized that uh, gauge fields, non abelian gauge fields, SU2 or any other non abelian gauge fields, can contribute to inflation while they're respecting uh, uh, the, the cosmic symmetries. Um, as a result, a new class of inflation models with SU2 gauge fields and axions is introduced that, I, uh, that we call SU2 axion models. Uh, but it was not the only unexpected result because soon we realized that uh, this, this class of models has a very rich uh, a phenomenology and in fact uh, it opens a new window to particle cosmology and it uh, leads to a novel observable signature uh, on gravitational wave background. So let's uh, take a closer look. Uh, um, so here comparing to, to a standard scenarios we have both the axion and the gauge field in the background during inflation. And uh, what is interesting is that comparing to, to normal scenarios, now parity is spontaneously uh, violated. Uh, so here, for example, we have the vacuum structure of SU2 axon inflation. Uh, we have the, uh, in the uh, horizontal axis, we have the axon field. And in the, uh, uh, sorry, in the vertical axis, we have the axon field. In the horizontal axis, we have the isotropic part of the gauge field. Uh, interestingly, the, uh, the vacuum uh, value for the SU2 gauge field is uh, specified by the axion field, and its sign is also specified by the sign of phi. Uh, so for a positive um, uh, axion value, we will have, let's say, the red uh, slow roll trajectory, and when uh, phi uh, or the axon is negative, we'll have the blue slow roll trajectory, which is the parity conjugated version of uh, the red one. Uh, the background uh, cosmology and also particles, uh, uh, scalar particles, are not sensitive uh, to this effect. Particles with spin, like fermions and spin two fields, are sensitive to this non trivial vacuum during inflation. And uh, interestingly, that leads to particle production during inflation. Uh, let's say, what does that mean? Um, before, uh, I mean, uh, uh, at the beginning of my talk, I talked about different uh, possibilities for particle production. And one of them was uh, particle production by an electric field. Uh, in a vacuum in fast space, we know that starting from vacuum, you can have this virtual pair of particles, but in a fraction of a second later, they will find each other and annihilate. However, if we have a strong electric field, 
Then what's happening is that imagine that you have this virtual pair of particles that get generated at some point, then the electric field is strong enough, it can break this loop of virtual pair and produce a pair of charged particles. Uh, that's the, the famous uh, Schrodinger pair particle uh, pair production. And uh, this is basically a non-perturbative uh, quantum effect. And uh, the, uh, the rate of uh, the pair production is given like this. And as you see, if you expand it, E is the electric, uh, it, this is for, the, uh, for this, uh, the, the electron and positron uh, uh, production in five space. Uh, and you can see that you cannot tailor expand this in terms of E. So it is a non-perturbative uh, uh, process. And if you want to explain it in terms of Feynman diagram, so you would basically need a, an infinite uh, number of uh, terms in your uh, series. Uh, interesting, I mean, that's a very beautiful uh, phenomenon. Uh, However, in flat space, it has never been observed because it requires a very large uh, electric field. Uh, but what about inflation? We know that in, in, the energy scales at inflations are extremely high. And also in this particular scenario of inflation that I introduced, we have a gauge field in inflation. So would that uh, actually make uh, 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 the thing is that in this scenario, Schrodinger particle production is not only happening and important, uh, but also it relieves observable signature. So it's extremely interesting. Uh, are there any questions? No. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Uh, so I can understand that you have mentioned about like Schrodinger particle. Uh, Schwinger effect, particularly, but uh, like, have you heard about something? <laughs> so, since you have mentioned this particle, this thing comes to my mind. People used to talk about stochastic particle production. Okay, like if you are uh, when so particle production means like uh, during that time you can able to write down uh, probably. Uh, the matter fluctuations or something like that. So there is a particular paper written by Bauman. It's basically from where's to cosmology. Uh, from, sorry? From where's means some electrical where to cosmology. Uh -huh. Something. They want to point that this particle production process can be thought of as kind of a electron is moving inside a where and facing some kind of impurities. So it's basically a Schrodinger problem you are solving instead of solving a particle production problem for the universe. Um, actually, I, I, I remember that I, um, I saw that paper, but I don't recall the details. Um, so they're up, uh, so they, they assume that this wire is in, a, in an expanding universe or yes, how is it? Yes, yes, yes. And, and which cosmic era is it in place? You know, uh, the where is not in expanding uh, universe in that way. They say that, like, once we solve any particle production problem, we need to solve some kind of Klein Gordon equation, some fluctuation, chi k. Now, this chi is basically a function of time. So, you just solve a uh, second order differential equation, like Mukhanov Sasak equation. Okay. Uh -huh. Now, they say that if you think of time as space and just think of the uh, profile like uh, effective you know that in uh, uh, this mukhanov sasaf equation we used to talk about an effective mass time dependent mass right. yes. so they say that think of similar kind of thing appearing inside an electrical well which is an impurity potential so they just translate the whole problem in a one dimensional problem uh, and uh, trying to analyze that. Why they, they did that? Because they said that directly solving the problem in the cosmology side may be not very uh, easy always. So they said that solving that problem would be a little bit better. And uh, the main problem is that if you have a time dependent mass, some 
for very specific cases you know the solution of the mohanosa's equation solution means i want to mean the analytic solution okay right but if you have some arbitrary uh, mass uh, time uh, dependence in the uh, mukhanov sasaki equation you just can't able to solve that then they say that oh we use this trick to solve that kind of problem so that's the main objective of that that paper so i'm just asking they used to call it stochastic particle production because they said that the stochasticity there in that mass term so they treat it to be some kind of noise i see so you can yeah. think of like some kind of brownian motion happening okay some yeah. zigzag interaction is happening and they are trying to understand what is the outcome of that so i'm just asking that this kind of particle production also taking care of this uh, randomness or something like that in the calculation um in our case um so first of all we assume that the uh, uh you can think about it in in uh in different ways about this, this particle production mm -hmm. uh, in this talk I, I i try to uh to limit myself to a case that the uh the gauge field has a, a web and uh it's an almost like a, a constant electric field uh which is this, the solution in this, this setup. And in that case, it's, uh, it has, I mean, all kind of, uh, if you assume that you have a scalar or fermion or a gauge field in the setup, you can um, analytically solve everything. And I actually did that. Uh, another perspective, in, in, that's just in inflation. If you want to do the same calculation during pre preheating, for example, uh, then, uh, yeah, as far as I know, I, I need simulations, but mm. uh, yeah, I, I uh, that that's a good idea. Maybe a bit a bit Bauman's uh, technique, we can uh, do it uh, much more efficiently. Okay. Uh, but during inflation, it's uh, it's totally doable. Uh, yeah, because, because there, there we know how it the time dip effective mass looks like. Exactly, and it's the power law, right? It's a yes. tau to some power because the yes. time dependence just coming from the expansion of the universe. Yes. And uh, another uh, uh, another perspective of this, this particle production is when the gauge field is uh, doesn't have the web but only produced by the action, and then the gauge field produces uh, fermions. And that's uh, another thing that I. Uh, uh, Maybe this will be very complicated during the epoch of reading because there, uh, like, it is not maybe the power law. That uh, right, but in inflation, this case is also uh, doable analytically, uh, and the, the reason is that uh, now the fermion production. If you have chiral fermions, you're generating these fermions by uh, chiral anomaly of uh, the gauge field. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's that's also doable in equation, but uh, but after equation and when the system is non-perturbative, uh, then uh, I can understand. Okay, so uh, now this uh, this axion uh, SU two setup, we have both of them in equation. We realize that because of this. Uh, this spontaneous parity violation in physics of inflation. We have a non-trivial vacuum, which leads to particle production. So any charged particle, uh, any uh, like particle which charge under this uh, uh, SU2 gauge field will get generated by Schrodinger effect in inflation. And then it will have some observable signature. Uh, so let me divide this big picture into two parts and explain each part of that. First, let's start with the uh, left-hand side. Okay, uh, now that we have, uh, so remember that in case that we had normal inflationary scenarios, in the perturbed metric, we had a tensorial mode, the primordial gravitational wave, uh, but that was the only tensorial mode because the scalar fields uh, uh, perturbing, perturbing a scalar field, you will end up with having like perturbed scalar field, no spin two. Uh, but in this case, that we have a SU2 gauge field, 
uh, if you pertype your gauge field around that uh, isotropic and homogeneous field configuration uh, that we discussed, uh, then we will have uh, several uh, different dynamical degrees of freedom, uh, some of scale, some uh, scalars, some vectors, and one tensorial degree of freedom, which I called it Bij. And this Bij, since it's a SU2, it's a non-abelian gauge field, it has self-interactions. And thanks to this, those self-interactions, this, this B field is chiral. So, uh, so now if I decompose the, the Bij, the tensorial mode, into its uh, left-handed and right-handed helicity states, that it would have different values in equation. And uh, this B, uh, this tensorial degree of freedom now provides a source for gravitational waves. And interestingly, it is coupled linearly to gravitational wave. Uh, Sayanta, you mentioned the case of the U1 gauge field and, uh, and about the, the magnetogenesis uh -huh. in inflation. Uh, and I, I, I told you that the scenario uh, and, and, and this one has some uh, similarities uh, and some very different differences. One of those differences is actually here. Uh, when you have a U1 uh, gauge field, uh, of course, uh, you cannot turn on a web unless breaking the spatial isotropy. But I say you can have it as a part of quantum fluctuation. Uh, it's a gauge field with a U, uh, spin one. So it also would source gravitational wave, but you need two spin one field to source a spin two. Uh, so your U1 gauge field would source gravitational waves. However, at second order, in this case, uh, I have a, a SU2 gauge field, still it's a, it's a spin one field, but I'm perturbing that around that uh, uh, isotropic and homogeneous field configuration. And interestingly, it will have this extra tensorial degree of freedom. And that's because uh, uh, in the background, I uh, identified the index of algebra, uh, which is SU2, with the uh, 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 spatial uh, uh, index, which is I. And uh, as a result, uh, this, uh, this field uh, uh, has a tens new tensorial degree of freedom and it source gravitational wave at the linear order. So comparing to the U1, uh, uh, it's, uh, it can produce gravitational wave more efficiently. The same thing source uh, scalar perturbations as well. At, uh, for the U1 case, at the second order, it source gravitational waves. At second order, it source scalar perturbations. In this case, this, this quantity uh, source gravitational waves at first order and scalar perturbations at second order. Therefore, uh, uh, it's possible for this scenario to have uh, uh, observable chiral gravitational waves which, without generating uh, 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 scalar Nagasian. However, for the U1, it's not possible. So this pi IJ is sourced from the thing you are talking about. I'm sorry? This pi IJ, this source time, is basically yeah. coming from those calculations. Exactly. So pi IJ is a linear function of this matrix B. Mm -hmm. uh, and now, uh, if you, uh, uh, you, you solve this field equation, you will see that uh, your gravitational waves has two parts. The first one is the, the, uh, the homogeneous solution where you turn off the source term. These are vacuum uh, gravitational waves. On the top of that, it would have this, this extra part, which is sourced by uh, this new tensorial mode. And uh, this is basically uh, by, by solving the Green's function of this equation. And uh, so as a result now, gravitational wave has two uh, uh, incoherent, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 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 two different uh, parts, the vacuum part and the source part. The, uh, the source part is sort of the carbon copy of this, this gauge field. So it is chiral and non-Gaussian. 
And as a result, it leads to a novel observable signature on CMB because it's observationally distinguishable from the vacuum fluctuations. And uh, it will hopefully uh, get uh, a prop by future CMB missions like Lightbird and CMB H4. Uh, okay, uh, then uh, I, I told you that uh, parity and CP are uh, violated in the scenario. Um, uh, for instance, uh, now we have chiral gravitational waves and uh, it can interestingly, uh, in, in the scenario, all the sucker of conditions, which one needs to explain the matter asymmetry are satisfied in inflation. Therefore, we can have an inflationary uh, baryogenesis and leptogenesis. And one realization of that is actually uh, explaining matter asymmetry by gravitational anomaly in a standard model, um, which is basically when R R tilde, the gravitational change simon, is not zero, and in the presence of uh, a, a scenario in which it has an imbalance uh, uh, between the left-handed and right-handed uh, particles, uh, you can have this, this gravitational uh, uh, production of uh, uh, leptons. Um, I think uh, if if you like, I can explain it more. But if if not, I can go to the next slide. Uh, oops. So. Um, so. Oops. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, and then uh, another uh, interesting thing about the scenario is that you can generate uh, fermions in inflation if they are charged under this SU2 gauge field in inflation. Uh, and that's basically by uh, by uh, the uh, the chiral anomaly, uh, which is given uh, here. Now that we have gauge fields in inflation, uh, the right hand side is uh, non-zero, and it can generate uh, the the fermions which are coupled to this gauge field. And as a result, it can lead to a new non-thermal mechanism for generating. Uh, 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 fermions and these dark fermions can be part of the dark matter that we observe today, and uh, as a result, it can also uh, be related to uh, to dark matter. Um, and uh, quite recently, I uh, I introduced a scenario in which uh, this the dark fermions can actually uh, this this the scenario can uh, simultaneously. Uh, explain a baryogenesis and dark matter production, um, all sourced by uh, by inflation. Uh, so we know that the, the standard model of particle physics is probably the most rigorous theory of physics uh, in in whole history. However, when it meets cosmology and astrophysics, it gets ridiculously incomplete. And it's big questions are the particle physics of inflation, because we don't really know the particle physics of inflaton. The origin of the matter asymmetry, uh, that we know that our universe is all over, uh, around us is full of matter and no sign of large scale of antimatter. And uh, particle nature of dark matter is another mystery. And also the primordial gravitational waves are the only missing prediction of inflation. Uh, on the other hand, fundamental discrete symmetries uh, and, their oops, and their violations played a key role in understanding the standard model and beyond, like uh, charge and parity violation in formulating the weak interactions and CP violation to explain the matter asymmetry. Uh, yet it is interesting that it's mostly assumed the physics of inflation preserve parity and CP. 
in this scenario uh, that we are talking about today, uh, SU2 action inflation, uh, uh, both parity and CP are spontaneously uh, broken and can relate all of the seemingly unrelated phenomena in early and late cosmology. So in a way, uh, uh, I mean, the ultimate decision is for nature to decide, but it looks, from the mathematical point of view, it looks like a complete set. Uh, okay, so let me uh, take a closer look at the, uh, the particle, these this three different kinds of particle production that I mentioned, the tensor and mode particle production, uh, the scalars, and fermions. Are there any questions so far? Okay, no. Uh, so, um, before this, we realized that our perturbed gauge field has a new tensorial degree of freedom in itself, and it's given by this uh, field equation. Uh, so, B plus and minus are uh, two different uh, uh, polarization states of this extra tensorial degree of freedom. Um, plus is the right handed polarization. A minus is a left-handed polarization, and this field equation is given by this super simple uh, field equation. And you, you see that the effective frequency squared of the field uh, is dependent on the, uh, the helicity uh, state. For one of the helicity states, let's say, um, uh, when, uh, uh, and it's also related to this parameter delta C, which is given by the background uh, field like this. In case the delta C, uh, we are in the red slower trajectories, delta C is positive. And when we are in the, the blue kind of uh, slower trajectories, delta C is negative. Let's assume that delta C is positive. Uh, so now the plus helicity state, of, uh, the, the, the tensorial uh, mode will have a, a short phase in which its effective frequency squared is negative. So it will have a, a short tachyonic uh, uh, growth for the B plus. Uh, and uh, remember that B plus was a chiral uh, field because uh, the minus helicity state doesn't experience this tachyonic growth, only the plus helicity state will have it. And therefore it's a chiral field. Uh, so the red, uh, the red line here is the, uh, the B plus field, which is the, uh, the one that experienced this, this tachyonic uh, growth. You'll see that around and a little bit after horizon crossing, it has this, uh, this enhancement. Uh, but after horizon crossing, because it's a massive field, it will decay. They, uh, the B minus, which is the other helicity state of this new tensorial uh, mode, is uh, shown by uh, black. And you see that there is no tech, uh, enhancement. It just uh, decays after, uh, uh, um, after horizon crossing. Uh, but B plus, although it decays uh, at super horizon scales, but because of this tachyonic instability, we will have particle production. Uh, and the, the number density of this B field is given like this. And uh, it's given, uh, uh, it, it's uh, specified in terms of this parameter delta C. Uh, okay, then uh, this, this B field, which is chiral, now sourced gravitational waves. Uh, therefore, my gravitational waves are, uh, are now uh, has two uncorrelated terms, uh, the H vacuum, which has the same nature as vacuum fluctuations, these are unpolarized and merely Gaussian, and this other part, which is sourced by this, this extra tensorial degree of freedom, and it's basically a carbon copy of that, so they're basically uh, chiral as their source, and since we are talking about non-abelian gauge fields, which are self-interacting, this, uh, this part is also non-Gaussian. And as a result, it is distinguishable from the normal uh, uh, predictions of, uh, uh, of inflation 
and it's testable because of its non-Gaussian uh, uh, signature, uh, which will be uh, propped by future CMB missions like Lightbird and CMBS4. I'm super excited and uh, looking, uh, actually I can't wait to, uh, to see the result. Uh, uh, but, but also because uh, this, this gravitational waves uh, are butylted, the, the thing that generates them, this, this parameter delta C, is increasing uh, uh, by uh, time. So the, the later the mode uh, generate, uh, get out of the horizon, the more enhancement it will receive because this, this, this enhancement is related to delta C. Um, therefore, uh, these, these gravitational waves uh, are blue tilted. So even if they are not strong enough uh, during inflation to, uh, to be propped by Lightbird and other CMB uh, missions, there is still hope for uh, the signature to be propped by uh, laser interferometers uh, like advanced LISA. And that, that will basically be a chiral gravitational wave background all over the sky with the same chirality. Because as you know, the astrophysical sources can also produce chiral gravitational wave background, but astrophysical sources are, are localized, so their chirality directions are, are different. Uh, but in this scenario, uh, it's the same chirality state all over the sky. Uh, another interesting thing about this scenario is that because parity is broken in inflation, now we have parity odd correlations of CMB, which otherwise would be zero. So now uh, a famous, uh, uh, a famous uh, kind of uh, scenario in which uh, we will have uh, parity odd correlations on CMB is the cosmic biorefringence. I think you may have heard about it, and that's basically when uh, the photon, the, the electromagnetic uh, um, force, is also coupled to an axion. It is different than this scenario. Uh, this is the cosmic birefringence. So now uh, the photon is coupled uh, to an axion. So apart from the, the standard model electromagnetic uh, uh, field equation, we have this extra term. And that will rotate the electric field and magnetic field. And if it happens, if we imagine that there is this axion, which is coupled to photon, then it can also produce this, this non-zero parity odd correlations on CMB. But since, uh, the, since photons are only, uh, can tell us up to the, so, uh, the point of CMB and not earlier, they are in uh, relatively higher Ls. However, this effect that I, uh, I told you in the SU2 axion inflation, that's happening because of the interaction, let's say, between the axion and gravitational wave, because this, this gauge field is actually somehow interaction with the, uh, with the gravi graviton. So that's a different interaction. And gravitational waves can tell us up to the surface of the uh, inflation. So that's an, a, a low L effect. So that's also distinguishable uh, if this, uh, this is this scenario that I'm talking about or the famous cosmic biorefringence. Another scenario that you can have the same signature as the scenario is when you have a gravitational uh, chern simon interaction that also has the same effect, uh, but there are uh, several theoretical uh, um, restrictions on this kind of uh, interaction. Uh, so uh, the next one is about a dark uh, heat or let's say a dark scalar field. Um, uh, in this case, we have, we can have uh, a scalar field which is charred under our gauge field and by the Schrodinger effect get generated in inflation. Uh, when we solve this, uh, the system, I personally get surprised by the results and I want you to share the same, uh, the same excitement. So uh, in order to, to see this, uh, this confusion, uh, let us tell you what would happen if you have charged scalar fields, which are 
uh, which are charged under a U1 gauge field. Imagine that there is a constant electric field all over the sky, like the standard model electric field. We are talking about the U1 gauge field. Then how uh, we, I mean, how would be the, uh, the scalar field production by this uh, electric field? This is the plot that shows this, this kind of Schrodinger effect. And you see that by increasing the, the, the value of electric field, you're basically increasing the, the amount of scalars that you're generating. When we solve the same system for this SU2, we found something very surprising. We realized that by increasing the electric field, we are decreasing the amount of scalars that we are generating. And I was very surprised. And I, before re really understanding the physics behind this, I, I thought that even it's wrong. Uh, but why? Why it's correct? And what's happening? What's the difference? The thing is that here we're talking an, about an isotropic SU2. It's not like an anisotropic SU2. If we instead of this field configuration, I would have an anisotropic SU2, I will have the same result as a U1. But with an isotropic SU2, for any electric field that I'm generating, I will generate the same amount value for the uh, roughly the same value for the electromagnetic field. So by increasing the electric field, I'm increasing the magnetic field. And in Schrodinger effect, uh, you need a very large electric field and a small magnetic field because the magnetic field will uh, somehow contribute to effective mass. So by increasing the magnetic field, you're making your field more effectively more massive and harder to get generated. And when we have isotropic SU2, by increasing the electric field, we're actually making them uh, effectively more massive. And that's why uh, by increasing electric field suppress the, the scalar production. Uh, okay, then we get to the last part, uh, which is about the fermion production. Now, uh, for fermions, I can basically have uh, two sources to generate fermions. Remember that massless fermions have conformal symmetry. So during inflation, if they had no source, they will exponentially decay. But if they are coupled to a source which is active in inflation and keep sourcing them, they can get generated in inflation. In this case, you can have two different kinds of sources. Uh, one is, of course, uh, is our SU2 gauge field. So imagine that they are charged under this SU2 gauge field. And they can also uh, be coupled uh, to, to an axion with this, this, this form. So uh, we can couple the chiral, uh, 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 the, the axial current of the fermions with an axion. And that can also produce uh, particles. But to, to produce particles with an axion, you need them to be massive. Um, otherwise, uh, uh, of course, I would be happy to tell you more about the details. Uh, but if, if, uh, if fermions are massless, axion cannot generate them. It's only sourced by the gauge field. Okay, in, in physics of inflation, now we have a setup that wireless parity and CP, and as a result, we can generate these this fermions uh, by a chiral anomaly uh, through their interaction with the gauge field. And also in case that they are uh, massive, they can also get generated uh, by the axiom. Uh, um, and of course the efficiency of this, this particle production related to the source of parity violation, uh, a CP violation, which in this case is, is a gauge field. And as a result, the scenario leads to a new non-thermal mechanism for generating massive or massless fermions in inflation, which otherwise would not be possible. Uh, so here I just have uh, the, uh, each of these particle productions, of course, will have back reactions on uh, our setup. And for the sake of uh, perturbat uh, perturbative expansion and linearity of uh, uh, the system, uh, we need the, the back reaction to be under control. Uh, so the smallest back reaction, as you may guess, is for the scalar fields that, as you remember, by increasing the electric field, 
with the increase the, the scalar production. Uh, the, uh, the next uh, uh, back reaction is from the fermions, uh, which is a bit larger than the uh, scalars. And finally, the largest back reaction is coming from this extra uh, spin two field, uh, which is uh, which you may uh, guess because the the, the part of the spin two particle production was exponentially related to delta c, and uh, so so that's uh, that's an important thing to uh, to keep in mind uh, to to specify the uh, the accessible parameter space of uh, the work. Uh, so let me just summarize. Uh, I hope I could uh, convince you that SU2 axial models of inflation uh, have a very rich particle cosmology. We have uh, spontaneous parity and CP violation in inflation. Uh, in the, uh, the tensorial sector, we have a new tensorial degree of freedom, which is linearly coupled to gravitational wave. And leads to uh, um, a, and actually leads to novel observable signatures on uh, uh, primordial gravitational waves in the form of um, chiral non Gaussian uh, and gravitational wave background. So as a result, this the setup comes with a smoking gun, and uh, also uh, the, the gauge field can produce uh, fermions in inflation. Uh, and in fact, uh, it is possible for that to, to, uh, to provide a common origin for inflation, dark matter, and barrier asymmetry. And uh, of course, it leads to novel mechanisms for uh, dark genesis and barrier genesis. Uh, I would, if I may, I tell you about the last work that I recently put on archive. Uh, and, uh, that actually can explain uh, the cosmological co coincidences, uh, which is uh, which I'm very excited about. Uh, the standard paradigm for uh, for cosmology is basically uh, mainly assumed that inflation uh, particle physics consists of a scalar uh, singlet beyond the standard model. Then we called it uh, uh, inflaton. And since gravitational waves are sourceless in inflation, they predict a, a, a primordial background uh, uh, of gravitational waves, which are unpolarized and Gaussian. And then uh, physics of inflation is CP symmetric. Therefore, uh, the CP violating uh, processes that we require to explain the matter asymmetry should happen after inflation and a, a, a popular uh, way to, to explain that is by CP violating phases in the neutrino sector, because there are unconstrained, the CP violating phases in the neutrino sector, which are remained unconstrained by the current data. And you can assume that they are large enough to explain the matter asymmetry that we observe today. Uh, as an alternative, uh, I introduced SU to write action inflation. Uh, of course, the ultimate decision is by nature, but it seems that uh, uh, it has some interesting uh, uh, features. Uh, so the particle physics of inflation in this uh, the setup is an action as the inflaton, and this extra SU2 gauge field, which is uh, uh, SU2 right. So now uh, the, uh, the standard model gauge group is extended by the SU2 uh, right gauge field. And then uh, also in the fermionic sector, we have three right-handed neutrinos which are charged under this SU2. Now that this, this, this gauge field is active in inflation because it's coupled to axion, so uh, the, the standard model gauge fields uh, are not coupled to this, this axion, so they have conformal symmetry in inflation and they decay uh, in physics of inflation, they are not uh, important, but this SU2 right, uh, which is active, uh, and uh, the same thing happens because the, uh, because this, this gauge field can source gravitational waves. We have chiral and Gaussian gravitational waves. And parity and CP are violated in inflation spontaneously. Uh, interestingly, CP can only be spontaneously violated in inflation because otherwise it leads to domain ball problem and it's dangerous. Uh, so, so it's very uh, natural for CP to 
be spontaneously violated by only mean inflation. And in this scenario, it naturally happened. Uh, and it can lead to a spontaneous uh, baryon and dark matter production in inflation because this SU2 right, is, uh, so all the right handed uh, fermions, this right handed neutrinos included, are coupled to this SU2 gauge field. Uh, and uh, as a result, it can, uh, this, this scenario can naturally explain this, uh, this surprising cosmological coincidences among cosmological parameters. As you know, uh, <laughs> there are just the surprising coincidences. The amount of uh, the uh, eta b, which is the, uh, the, the quantity by which we quantize the amount of matter asymmetry in the universe, has happened to be very close to the curvature power spectrum of the universe, which is very surprising. <laughs> and the other thing is that uh, the omega dark matter and omega baryons are happen to be very close. And uh, if they are given by different physics, it's really hard to explain this, uh, uh, this uh, coincidences. In the end, it might happen to be just an accident, but it's just too good and uh, suspicious. Uh, so what's beautiful about this SU2 uh, right action inflation is that it can naturally explain this, this, uh, this cosmological coincidence. Okay, thank you. Questions? Yeah, first of all, I just want to thank you for giving such an elaborated and detailed uh, introduction to the subject. I'm very hopeful that the other people will be surely benefited out of that, mostly the students and all, we all researchers. And uh, now this is the time for questions. If you really have any question, please ask. And just before doing that, please unmute yourself and give a clap for Azadeh for giving such a nice talk. So. Thank you. And uh, if you have any really question, please ask any short thing if you want to clarify, you please ask. Any question, please, from the audience. And of course, you can send me an email anytime. Yeah, so that, that's also true. Uh, people can go to the SARMS website and can find Azadeh's homepage and write down an email regarding any question, any doubt. Once this is posted, other people will also see. And if you have any question, please contact Azadi regarding any doubt or any clarification. She will be happy to give the answers. And um, yeah, like from my side, uh, one last question. So, so like, since you have talked about spin one field, okay, is it possible to uh, consider this kind of scenarios for higher spin fields? Uh, by high spin field, you mean if if the axion is coupled to, let's say, graviton or yeah. what kind of higher field, for example? Yeah, so, that, yeah, so particularly like, yeah, particularly the kind of interaction you are telling, if it is coupled with gravity and something like that. Uh, well, there are scenarios that they, they couple the axion with the graviton, and that's uh, the chern simons gravity kind of interactions. And yeah. uh, uh, actually, this is basically this, uh, I think back in 2006, uh, Alexander, uh, Peskin, Chekjabari, uh, they, they formulated uh, a, uh, an inflationary leptogenesis scenario based on that. Okay. Uh, so that's one possibility. But recently, um, I mean, uh, people uh, uh, studied that in more details. And uh, it, I mean, it seems that the gauge fields interactions have a better chance uh, for uh, sure. To be observationally uh, uh, detected, and also, uh, I think it's it's way more easier to. Uh, I mean, it's, it's. I would I would expect that uh, there is more 
chance for gauge field interaction with the axial and that the graviton. If your question is about um, what other kind of uh, higher spin, uh, you mean something like when it's been three half or something like that? Um, yeah, like people have, uh, so once you talk about super gravity and all, so there is a super partner of the graviton, which is the gravitino, which has a spin three by two. So I'm asking that such kind of scenarios people have explored or something like that. I think that Daniel Bauman is interested in that. And I'm sure they, they discussed that in some of their papers. Uh, yeah, honestly, I, I don't because have a clear because of only Daniel, I have asked you the question because they have generalized this, the formalism for spin S. So that's right. that observationally, how the status, the people are thinking about something like that, such kind of thing exists or something like that, because uh, formulation wise, people have started looking for those things. But I don't know about the observation. So do you have any idea? Uh, honestly, no. Uh, this this last slide that I talked about the uh, the, the extension of uh, the standard model, uh, I limited this this paper to uh, the simplest, uh, complete beyond the standard model that can explain neutrino mass, uh, uh, and that's basically left foot symmetric uh, uh, models. Uh, so. Uh, it's, I mean, the, the only extra beyond standard model fields that I have in this setup is uh, three uh, right-handed neutrinos, uh, the SU2 right gauge field, and the uh, SU2 uh, right uh, triplet uh, Higgs, uh, left and right. Uh, so these are basically uh, the fields, but no higher spin fields. Uh, there's a very interesting question. Honestly, I don't have a good answer. No, but because nobody have, I think, the answer right now at present. It's very maybe important. Daniel has. I, I, I'm not sure actually, but no, maybe. No, but like, I'm saying that observation wise, you can actually theoretically formulate many things, but like at the end of the day, people should know that is it possible to detect or not. That's that's important part. I'm very happy to see that your things are like. Com com compatible with the observation. Things are like going in a good direction. So that's very good. Uh, maybe this is higher spin fields have some robust uh, signature on non-Gaussianity that you can tell the spin. Okay. Uh, yeah, honestly, I, I don't know, but maybe we can find some answer in, in Daniel's lab, uh, papers. Okay. Yeah. But anyways, but, but, thank you for the detailed uh, clarifications of your works and the other works in this area because it's really helpful even for myself. I have learned a lot today. And uh, thank you very much again. And uh, uh, maybe later I will see you again with new ideas and new uh, theories and new inventions of yours in my forum. And uh, once you are free, feel free me to contact. You are always welcome to give lecture here. It's like very good. Uh, uh, and most importantly, I, I really appreciate the slides that you have made. It's like looking awesome. <laughs> you put a lot of effort to make it really nice. So that's, I have to say, really commendable and very nice. And before going, before leaving, I just want to take a picture of yours because of my forum, I need to put it. Uh, so smile, please. Uh, uh, my photo is coming, so I just have to. I have a very bad hair day, so. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Thank you. And, uh, Maybe we can, like, since you are working on the same, uh, at least in theoretical cosmology, we can discuss sometime when you have time or something like that. Uh, I'm hopeful that you also know that what kind of work I'm also doing, mostly the quantum side. So you can discuss anytime and we can chat. It's, it's very good that, like, 
uh, somebody is doing this kind of work, which is really uh, commendable. It's really nice. And we are seeing you from long time. And uh, though we are meeting you, uh, uh, I'm meeting with you first time uh, here, but if you came in 2012 at that time, probably this would be our second or third meet. Yeah, I think we met at Goa in 2011. No, I didn't meet you in Goa. I actually haven't attended the Goa conference. Oh, but maybe in Pune? Pune, probably. 2011 in uh, Ayuka. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was. I have some memories. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I met you before. Yeah. And maybe ICTP also because I have attended many. Yes, ICTP. Yes, yes. That that's also possible. Summer. I'm sure that I met you before, but yeah, I just summer, didn't recall. Summer, yeah. I have attended like five summer school on cosmology. Maybe I have seen you somewhere. <laughs> of course, yes. <laughs> and also the good part, I, probably you don't know, uh, uh, your supervisor and the director of this institute are long time friend. So, uh, so my my supervisor, you mean uh, Hiro Komatsu? No, uh, Sheikh Jabbari. Ah. So Sheikh Jabbari and Sudhakar Panda at that time, like very long time ago, they are the postdocs at ICTP. So. He told me that we used to uh, enjoy a lot during that time. Physics is completely different. Now you guys are like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Sayantan, thank. I, I I want to thank you for organizing this series. It's very helpful. It's just at this 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 hard crazy times. It adds some excitement. Uh, yeah. To to people like me to get connected with other people and of course for graduate students, I think it's uh, it's really a, a valuable uh, series. Thanks a lot and thanks for uh, having me. It sure. was a pleasure. <laughs> Stay safe and healthy. Bye. Yeah, looking forward to see you in, in actual uh, space time. <laughs> yeah, hopeful to see you again because now we are seeing you because of uh, there is no other option. Like, and hopeful there will be some uh, future conferences or maybe some visit I can have in CERN or something like that. Of course, yes. Yeah. See you then. See you. Bye.